Good morning, Vallejo Drive Church. Happy to see each one of you. Well, my role today is to begin the worship service, but because I have the pulpit, I'm going to be selfish and use it to read a letter that I wrote last night to Pastor Shane. Yeah, I thought I should introduce it by saying, late last night as my husband was asleep, I wrote a love letter to Shane. <laughs> Dear Shane, I am really disappointed that you are leaving your pastoral role here at Vallejo Drive. Yet I know you to be a man who lives intentionally so as to follow the Spirit's subtle beckonings. You are stepping out in faith even though, like Abraham, you do not know exactly where you are going. Indeed, I've learned from my own experience that sometimes God's best for us is the scariest option, the one that requires and develops faith. God is with you. Do not be afraid. I'm eager to see what God brings in your future. I know it's going to be fantastic. But if I may, allow me to dwell on my narcissistic disappointment. Shane, in my lifetime as an SDA, I've had many pastors. They all were lovely people who mostly did a decent job as a pastor. In my experience, however, it has been the exception to have a pastor from whom I actually learned something. You are one of those exceptions for me. From you, I have gained fresh, profound perspectives about the Bible and Christian traditions that can enliven our spirituality. Your gift of teaching was one of our church's treasures, and your teaching was underscored by your personal witness, one that was consistently respectful, open-hearted, humble, and long-suffering. If you go to church board meetings, you know that's really true. Thank you, Shane, for sharing your academic and your experiential knowledge of Jesus with us. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. So yes, after church, we are going to celebrate with lots of cake. But Shane, I learned just last night that you don't like cake. <laughs> Dog on it. And he doesn't actually like cookies or any dessert. But you like fruit. So given that cake isn't appealing, I'd like you to have this. OK. Let us continue to worship. I'm reading Psalms 33. Upright is the word of the Lord, and all his works are trustworthy. He loves justice and right. Of the kindness of the Lord, the earth is full. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their host. For he spoke, and it was made. He commanded and it stood forth. See, the eyes of the Lord are upon those who fear him and upon those who hope for his kindness to deliver them from death and preserve them in spite of famine. Our soul waits for the Lord, who is our help and our shield. May your kindness, O Lord, be upon us who have put our hope in you.
you please stand with me for the invocation? God, our Father, who by sending into the world the word of truth and the spirit of sanctification made known to the human race your wondrous mystery, grant us, we pray, that in professing the true faith, we may acknowledge the trinity of eternal glory and adore your unity, powerful in majesty. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, hymn number two, All Creatures of Our God and King.
Hello and good morning, church. Just a couple of uh, quick announcements for you today. Um, as always, I want to take this chance to talk about Koinonia. Uh, that's our small group prayer meeting that takes place in the fellowship hall uh, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. And if you don't know what happens there, we just get together and have a simple meal together. We have a short worship and then we break off into our different Bible studies. It's really cool as well because simultaneously they have a really excellent, well thought out program going on at the same time called Koinonia Kids, um, where the children have their own special story time and Bible study as well. So this really is something that we want to encourage uh, the whole family to come along to. And I haven't had the chance to go very often to Koinonia because I've been doing my own small group in my house. But the last couple of weeks I have attended, and I can tell you that I have personally been very uh, enriched spiritually from my time there. Really powerful um, just opportunity to have fellowship and prayer uh, with the other members here. And I promise you, you really will learn a lot about scripture as well. So all that to say, I really encourage you, if, even if you haven't come before, that's okay. You can jump in at any time. So think about coming to Koinonia, uh, maybe even next Wednesday you want to give it uh, your first go. Uh, secondly, something that I'm sort of more in charge of, uh, which is the young adult program, which we call uh, Praxis, and that is, takes place every Friday, so I encourage you again next Friday, uh, we're going to meet in the cafe at 7pm for snacks, a uh, hangout, and a short discussion. And so if you're a young adult here, and as I look out now, I do see some young adults that I don't know so well, uh, if you've been here uh, at Vallejo, you've been attending for a while and you feel like you really haven't connected with any other young folks like yourself yet, then I really do think that this is a great program for you to come to. Um, also, because I'm in charge of that, I'm, I'll be personally offended if you don't come. So please, please do. Now lastly, and on a kind of more serious note, uh, as, as Beth was saying at the beginning of today's service, it's obviously with a lot of sadness today uh, that we say goodbye to Pastor Shane. Uh, Shane has been serving here at Vallejo Drive for about six years, six years or so. Uh, initially, he started with the young adults going part-time, but then uh, Pastor Mike noticed the, uh, the talent and the um, passion for ministry in Shane, and so he, he quickly managed to hire Shane full-time, and Shane has been working for the last three years or so, working more closely with... Uh, with uh, d teaching, uh, discipleship, uh, you'll see him up here preaching a lot. And he and I, I must say, have spent an almost unhealthy amount of time together over the past uh, two years or so. So I know that there's definitely going to be a personal void in my own life, and I'm sure many of you will feel similarly. Um, anyone that has experienced Shane's teachings uh, will have gained a lot of very practical knowledge about Christianity. And I think they will also have sensed that they are being taught by a true disciple of Jesus. And that doesn't happen uh, all the time. So Shane, uh, we thank you so much for your leadership, uh, your spiritual guidance, and your friendship. Uh, here's a small gift just to say thanks. And may God just continue to bless you in your, in your ministry and all your endeavors. Thank you so much. And lastly, uh, if you want to personally say goodbye to Shane, give him some personal words of encouragement, uh, again, as Beth said at the beginning, do join us in the courtyard after the service to share um, some fellowship and some cake together. And because Shane doesn't like cake, that means there'll just be more for you. So come to that. Wish him well. Um, now is the time for our children's story. Um, so while the kids are coming up to the front, I encourage you to take this time to get up and, and greet one another. Thanks. Where are the children? Come on down, this is your time. All the children up here, and if you feel that you are still a child, you're more than welcome to join us. If you feel that you're still a child, you can sit here, you can join us. Yes. 
All the children, come on up. Have a seat over there. Hi. How are you? Hi. How are you? Good job. Have a seat. I have a very special story to share with you today. All right. It's always good to see your beautiful faces up here. Here we go. She is still coming. There you go. All right. So today, I want to tell you a story about a little puppy. Who likes puppies? Yes, I know puppies are the best. I want to talk to you about a little puppy. This puppy has had no name. Okay. He was under a year old, and he was out on the streets of Glendale. He would cross the street right in the middle of the cars. Cars would honk at him. Eh, 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 be careful, little dog. And the little dog would just run across the street. And other people would come and say, who's this dog? Who this dog belongs to? Get out of here, dog. Get out of here, dog. And the dog would just go and be on the corner like, mm, mm, mm. And this little dog was very scared because there were so many people out on the streets of Glendale. And this little puppy, just under a year old, was trying to find his way to somewhere. He was completely lost. He was hungry. So hungry. Days with no food. Nobody knew who that dog belonged to. The dog was so dirty, the little puppy. He was so dirty. His fur was filthy. He stinked. And he was just running like a stray dog on the street, looking for someone that would care for him. Well, you know what? One time, you know where Americana, the Americana is? Yes. One time, there was someone walking by the Americana with their family. And they saw this little dog right on the corner by the Apple store, right in the little corner. And they said, who does this dog belong to? And they looked around and, and they tried to approach the dog. And the dog went to the little corner. The puppy went to the little corner. And the puppy was like, oh, no. The, the, the puppy was so afraid that he was going to get hurt. And this person reached down, pat the little puppy, grabbed the puppy, and started asking around, who does this puppy belong to? Is it yours? Is it yours? They looked all over the place. They tried to find who that puppy belonged to. And the poor little puppy was so comfortable when that person picked him up. And he was so happy that someone was caring for him. I want to show you a picture of this little puppy. Are you ready? Here's the little puppy that I'm talking about. That little puppy right there. Well, guess what? That puppy today has a name. Do you know why? Because someone picked him up, cleaned him, cared for him, gave him a nice haircut, and fed him. Nowadays, this little puppy has a name. That person named him Bandit because he was uh, lost in the streets, right? But now this person, this puppy has a home. And the family embraced the puppy. The puppy was so happy when he came home. And they had, he had kids to play with. You know, did you know that puppies love kids to play with? Yes. Well, this story is a true story. This story happened about five years ago. The puppy was under a year old. And they could tell because the veterinarian looked at his teeth. And you know you can tell the age of the, the dog by the teeth, right? And the, the veterinarian said the dog was just under a year old. So now this puppy, now Bandit, he's six year old now. Do you want to meet Bandit? Yeah? Okay. Bandit, can, can you come out here? Where's Bandit? Where's Bandit? <gasps> here comes Bandit. Oh, there he is. Hello, Bandit. How are you? Well, he doesn't look lost anymore. Yes, 
this is a story of bandit. He's no longer lost because Miss Teresa and, and his family and her family found him. And now he cannot stay away from her. She takes him everywhere. He goes in the car. He goes into trips. He goes to the supermarket sometimes. He goes to the movies sometimes. Yes. And Bandit now is healthy. Bandit looks good. And Bandit has someone that loves him. And do you know what? He loves them too. Do you know why? Because her family adopted Bandit. And now he belongs to someone. And he's part of the family now, isn't he? He's part of the family now. You know, kids, I want to tell you something. The same way that Miss Teresa's family adopted Bandit, Jesus adopted us. And he cares for us. And he took us from the dirt, from we were hurt, we were dirty, we were hungry, we didn't look good. And Jesus took us in. And he cared for us. And he washed us. And he gave us food. And he gave us food and he cares for us every day. And all we need to do is to love Jesus back the same way Bandit loves Miss Teresa's family. He cannot stay away from her. And that's what I want you guys to remember. Let's be like Bandit. Be thankful that Jesus cared for us and love Jesus like he is our Father in heaven. Do you remember? Can you remember that? Okay, now Miss Teresa is going to pick him up, and on your way out, you can pat him once, okay? And then you can go back to your seats, and you can stay with your mom and dad. We have no children's uh, story today, okay? Thank you so much, Bandit, for coming in. You've been, you've, you've been a good boy today. Thank you. All right, on your way out, back to your seats, you can go ahead and pat Bandit. Go ahead, come on up. Come on up. Thank you, Bandit. All right, you can go back to your seats now. Let other people pet him, and you can get back, go back to your seats. Thank you so much for listening quietly for the story today. Will the deacons please come forward? Good morning, church. Today's offering goes towards Conference Developing Ministries. The primary purpose of the Department of Ministries Development is to partner with local conferences in developing and supporting outreach ministries that will transform and evangelize communities. If you would like to support Conference Developing Ministries, please write it on your envelopes. All loose offerings will go to church budget. I invite you this morning to give with a joyful heart. The deacons may now collect the offering.
thank you for another beautiful Sabbath day. Please bless and multiply these tithes and offerings, and may our offerings contribute to the continuation of the ministry of Jesus Christ in our conferences, communities, and beyond. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please be seated. It's now prayer time, and if you have a special prayer request we or need, we invite you to just make your way down today and uh, come on down to the front at this time so we can pray with you and for you while we sing that song, Now Dear Lord, as we pray, as we come to you in prayer.
if you're able, wherever you are, please kneel for prayer or choose whatever posture you wish as we pray. Oh, gracious God, today, we lift your name high today like a blanket of praise. Thank you that you cover and embrace a fallen world. Thank you, God, for this grace that flows endlessly to each one of us this day. Lord, we celebrate your love as we lay down our burdens down at the foot of the cross. Thank you, O oh God, that you breathe, we can breathe in resurrection life. Thank you that we are fully restored and redeemed by your power. Lord, we recognize that we come from many places and various situations. We suffer, we hurt, we have a diversity of ills. But, oh God, we know that you are a God who sits high, but you're looking low. You see us where we are, you hear our hearts cry, and you know us by name. Lord, we remember that we are not alone, but you've got your hands in our business. And so today, oh God, we just want to thank you that you have dispatched power to this earth in the form of your son, Jesus. You demonstrated heaven's greatest power, the love of God for every broken human being. You demonstrate your love, a love that transforms, a love that renews and restores and revives and quickens us from the dead. And oh God, we just thank you today for this power, this power from the throne on high, the power of love. We thank you, O oh God, that we can claim and plead the blood of Jesus over all our situations, over every circumstance. We know that the blood of Jesus still has power to bring about new life and new healing. And so today, O oh God, we claim that blood. We plead the blood of Jesus over every situation, over our brokenness, over every sickness that we may suffer. And I pray specifically for somebody here today who is struggling with an illness or somebody who has a family member who is hurting, suffering, in pain, somebody who's empty, somebody who is lonely, somebody who is depressed. Oh Lord, today I pray that you would lift them by your spirit's power. Bring them new life, renewal, give them the blessed assurance that they are not alone, that you have not abandoned them, but you've got them in the hallow of your hand, that you hold them ever close and that you shelter them under the shadow of your wings. And Lord, I pray today that we as a congregation can experience the togetherness that comes from the unifying power of your spirit. Fill us, each one. Bless us, each one. Experience with us today that transforming renewal that comes from your abiding presence. And may we have the blessed assurance that your spirit, your power, gives us new life. And Lord, I pray today for this man of God who breaks the bread of life this morning. Shadow him, O oh God, in the hallow of your hand. Keep him out of the gunshot of the devil. Take him, O oh Lord, this morning. Wash him with hyssop inside and out. Hang him up to dry and drain him dry of sin. Pin his ear to the wisdom post, O oh God, and make his words sledgehammers of truth beating on our stony hearts. That today, as we hear the word of God being preached, that somebody, somebody's life will be watered, somebody's heart would be changed, and all of us would leave this place declaring, surely we have been with Jesus today, and it has been good to have been here. I pray these mercies in the precious name of Jesus, for his name's sake. Amen.
gospel reading is from it's from Matthew chapter 28 verses 8 through 20 16 through 20 now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came to, and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am always with you. I am with you always to the end of the age. Just leave this problem for somebody else, I guess. Uh, is that going to stay? Is it, this, this works okay? Okay. Well, good morning, guys. Uh, it's so good to be here again. Um, but, you know, before I begin... I just have to take a moment to thank all of you for the opportunity and the honor that it has been to serve here uh, for these five and a half years. It was October 2012 that I um, first came here. Uh, Pastor Mike invited me to come to be a part-time assistant for the youth ministry. And over the years, as Luke mentioned, my, my role here gradually, uh, increasingly grew and grew. And so uh, yesterday, as I was thinking about this, I wanted to go back and just kind of get a sense of the trajectory. So in 2014, I preached one sermon here in the, in the sanctuary. In 2015, I preached two sermons in here. In 2016, I preached four sermons, so we're, we're doubling each year. Uh, and then last year, 2017, uh, I preached 21 times uh, last year, so uh, it's, thank you, thank you. So I have to thank all of you for these opportunities uh, to, to speak, and over these years it's been a blessing to work alongside you, and I've grown a lot as a teacher, as a preacher, and through your ministry to me and your example, I have grown uh, as a more uh, committed follower of Jesus. So thank all of you so much. Um, now, despite all of the time that I spend up front, it comes as a, a surprise maybe to some that I really don't enjoy public speaking. <laughs> uh, I don't enjoy being the center of attention. I don't enjoy being in the spotlight. Uh, so I, I actually, I really dislike those things. Uh, but I love preaching. And I think preaching to me is something else entirely. Because I, I enjoy preaching because I know that you didn't come to see me. Uh, I enjoy preaching because I know you didn't come to hear my words or to learn more about me. The best preacher, in my opinion, is one who kind of disappears behind the text. Uh, and that's what I, that's what I try to do. Uh, I try to become as transparent a window as possible uh, through which you can see the Lord, because I know you didn't come to see me, but you came to see him. And you didn't come to hear what I had to say, uh, but you came to hear the word of God. So this morning, uh, this sermon will be self-indulgent, uh, but by that I mean it's not going to have anything to do with me. <laughs> uh, this is the kind of sermon that I would want to preach. Uh, some of you like it, some of you don't. It'll be a little more like... Uh, a lecture, not a lot of stories, not a lot of jokes, not a lot of illustrations, but I think uh, that this morning's message is the summary of what I believe the gospel to be, so I, I wanted to share that with you this morning. It's not my farewell message, uh, but as we read from the gospel of Matthew, uh, this is Christ's farewell message to the disciples. And he begins by saying, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And it's important that we realize that Jesus is able to make this claim, that all authority belongs to him. He makes this claim after his resurrection from the dead and not before. If you recall at the beginning of Matthew's gospel, the devil comes to him and tempts him and says, all the kingdoms of the world will be yours if you bow down and worship me. 
But Jesus refuses, you see, because Jesus had different plans. Jesus is not going to gain all authority in heaven and on earth by submitting to the devil, but by conquering him and reclaiming what the devil had stolen. And the resurrection of Jesus is that victory. Paul describes it this way to the Ephesians. He says, the Father raised Jesus from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but in the one to come. The resurrection of Jesus is the exaltation to the right hand of the Father. And why is he exalted to the highest place? Why is Jesus given the name above every name? Because on the cross, Jesus took the lowest place. Again, as Paul explains to the Philippians, he says, Christ took the form of a slave. Being born in human likeness and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, because of this, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee should bow at the name of Jesus in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Now, what does that mean uh, that those who are under the earth, what does that mean but that Jesus has dominion not only over heaven and earth, but over the realm of the dead as well. As Christ will say in the book of Revelation, I am the first and the last and the living one. I was dead, and see, I am alive forever and ever. I have the keys of death and of Hades. Jesus has the keys of Hades. Jesus has the keys of death, meaning the gates of the underworld cannot contain him. See, those keys are the power over death that he wins in the resurrection. He wins a victory over all the powers of the world, even over death itself. Again, as Paul will say to the Romans, for this reason, Christ died and lived again, so that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. So when the risen Jesus comes to the disciples and says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he is claiming victory, victory over the world. Victory over the kingdoms of the world, victory over sin, victory over the devil, even victory over death itself. And in light of that victory, he says to the disciples, go. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In essence, Christ is saying, because I am risen from the dead, Go and baptize. And what's the relationship between Jesus' resurrection and our baptism? Paul makes it very plain in Romans chapter 6. He says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. You see, in Christ's death and resurrection, he unlocks the gates of death and makes a way to eternal life. So if we want to share in Christ's glory, that is, if we want to live and reign with Jesus for all eternity, then we must also die with him. In order to be united to him in his resurrection, we must be united to him in his death. And we do this through baptism. In baptism, 
we die with Christ. And if we have died with Christ, then we will also be raised with Christ, the Bible says. Why then are we baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? Because this Trinitarian formula encapsulates the meaning of our baptism. To say God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is a summary of the entire gospel. Think back again to the gospel of Matthew when Jesus is baptized. And the gospel says, when he had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. You see, at the baptism of Jesus, the Holy Spirit descends on him and he is proclaimed to be the Son of God. And this is for our sake. Make no mistake that it's not as if prior to this Jesus had not received the Holy Spirit. It's not as if prior to this Jesus was not already the Son of God. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live and reign for one God as one God for all eternity. But at the baptism of Jesus, we see this scene unfold for our sake. Because when we are baptized, we receive that same Holy Spirit. And so when we are baptized, we are declared children of God. Because we are baptized into that body, that body of Christ. And so sharing in his person, we are adopted as children of God. Again, the Bible says, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. You see, Jesus Christ is the only begotten son of God. We know that language from Scripture, right? Jesus is God's only Son, we say. Jesus is the only Son of God by birth. Jesus is the only Son of God by nature. But we, when we receive the Holy Spirit, we become adopted as God's children. So then we are baptized in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because when we receive the Holy Spirit, we are united to Christ, the Son, so that we too may call God our Father. And now, here is where it gets practical. Because Christ says, Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. Having been baptized, we're now called to obedience. Because having been baptized into Christ's death, our lives must now take on this cruciform shape. We must live our lives in conformity to Christ's passion. His sufferings must become our sufferings. What pains him must pain us. The life of baptism is what Paul describes to the Galatians when he says, I've been crucified with Christ. Therefore, I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In baptism, we are made dead to sin because the old self has passed away. The old you was buried in the waters of baptism, never again to return. And now, having been put to death in the flesh, we are made alive in the Spirit. The Holy Spirit floods into our souls, adopting us as children of God. So now we live a new life, not one of sin, but of righteousness, not of selfishness, but of selfless love. So by virtue of your new identity, your new life in Christ, you are called to a new way of living, a life of perfect obedience, a life of holiness in which we obey everything Christ has commanded us. And that may, that may strike us as quite daunting. 
to obey everything that Christ has commanded us. But make no mistake about it. Jesus says the life of holiness is not easy. The gate is narrow and the road is hard that leads to life. And there are few who find it. But we must remember that God not only calls us to holiness, but he equips us with holiness. To obey everything that Christ commanded may seem overwhelming, but keep in mind that the commandments of Christ are just this one thing. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. And there's the key. Our love for one another, which is our duty and our salvation, is itself an effect of having received the love of Christ. If we are to learn how to love, we must learn to be loved. We love because he first loved us. For while we were still enemies, Christ died for us. As Paul says in Romans 5.5, 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. You see, that Holy Spirit that we receive is the love of God poured into our hearts. And so by receiving that Spirit, by abiding in that Spirit, and every day walking in that Spirit, we will fulfill every commandment. For the whole law is summed up in a single commandment, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Because the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, patience and kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. It is the promise of the abiding presence and power of the Holy Spirit with which Christ left the apostles. And that's why he's able to say to them, Remember, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Because through the presence and power of the Spirit, Christ is always with his church. And so I can think of no better message to leave you with than this. To remain open to the Spirit through scripture and prayer and song and fellowship. Never silence the voice of conscience in your heart. Follow the Spirit wherever he leads. But know that it is the role of the Holy Spirit to make you more like Jesus. So expect the Spirit to lead you in places that you don't want to go. Expect the Holy Spirit to lead you to your own cross. But there, at the cross, united with Christ in his death, you will also experience the greatest love, the greatest joy, and the greatest peace. Because it is in receiving the Holy Spirit, it is in being conformed to the image of the Son that we come to know God as our Father. And so we praise the eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who was and is and is to come. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing song, Praise Ye the Father, hymn number 70. Thank you.
final blessing, I want to leave you with these words from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 8. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. May Almighty God bless us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh-huh.